Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Kevin McReynolds, and uh, I know that I'm in the midst of mostly Lutherans. There's a few Methodists up front in the Methodist seating, but all the Lutherans, they stick to the back. Is that true? My dad was Methodist. That's why I'm making the joke, so it's okay. Um, As Dave uh, finishes the lighting of the candles, I thought I would just take a moment and uh, welcome you all to uh, worship services with us today, both our guests and visitors, uh, as well as our members alike. It's a pleasure to be able to serve you today uh, with the word of the Lord. Um, A couple of uh, just brief announcements uh, in advance of services today. Um, At the first service I shared, um, just... uh, this last week we have been working, or I have been working, to try and um, gather up some of the guidance documentation um, that we have from the Arkansas Department of Health, uh, as well as um, a couple of independent studies, one of which was uh, from Harvard Medical School on um, the use of some of our documentation and the, and the hymnals and such in church. Um, just to let you know that we are making preparations um, for starting to meet up um, maybe with some of the uh, auxiliary groups of the church, such as Christian Women's Society um, or Vespers or things like that, but uh, in Bible studies as well. Before we um, open up and start doing things in total or in full, we wanted to make sure that we had plans in place um, for the event that someone were to be infected with COVID um, and then notify the church. And so uh, just so you know, we are working on those plans. Um, and as those become available, we'll try and make you aware of them here. But it's my goal to, um, to try and walk the balance between uh, the regulations that have been placed on us and the freedom that we have and the knowledge that we have that Christ has overcome the dead, uh, death and the grave. And so we want to walk that balance and, and try and provide the very safest environment that we can here at the church for these groups to meet in addition to worship services while at the same time recognizing that uh, our Lord has come to uh, instill in us uh, a great confidence and um, to take away our fear um, that even death can affect us because he has raised from the dead and he has intentions of raising us from the dead to live a life eternal. And so uh, as we work to do that, I hope you can uh, hang with us a little bit. Um, One of the big challenges that we have at the moment is trying to find a way to record Um, the names of those who are with us, and so once that um, becomes apparent, how we're going to try and handle that so that we can record attendance, and um, that will allow us then to make notification in the event that someone were to become ill um, and and have been in presence with us here in church. Once we have some answers on some of that stuff about exactly how we're going to go about doing it, we'll try and pass it along to you. The reason I made that announcement first is because it leads me to the second one, which is... um, the uh, Vespers Society is planning to meet tomorrow evening at 6.30. And uh, Maggie asked me at the first service to make that announcement so that if you would be um, interested in joining, um, please let her know. I think uh, there was some concern as to whether or not they were going to meet or if, if they could because Pastor was working on this and did Pastor say nobody could meet? Well, I think there was some miscommunication in there and we've, we've got that air cleared. But I uh, just want you to know that we are working to try and make it possible for people to be here um, with us. Um, that's also worth noting for those who are joining us online um, that uh, you're certainly welcome to join us and you'll hopefully hear some of this even in today's sermon with the invitation to be here. Um, God calls us to gather together as a body of Christ together. Uh, two other quick announcements I want to make is um, in your bulletins you have the weekly prayer list. Uh, I have not been praying over these names individually um, during worship services because they are printed before you and the encouragement is, is that you would take these lists home with you and pray over these folks. I have two names to add to the list today that came too late to make it into the bulletin. Um, the first is uh, we learned of the death of Barbara Reif, and, um, and so we pray for her family and their peace and comfort. Um, and then last evening, I found out at the first service this morning that member David Ennis passed away uh, last evening. And so we lift up their families um, in the wake of their passing, and uh, we hold high uh, the cross in the empty tomb where Christ promises us that he will raise those who die in a death in faith uh, to life everlasting to be with him. And so um, unless there are any uh, other changes or uh, corrections or things that need to be added, I'll encourage you guys to take those with you. Um, we will pray over them and pray over those others who are in our hearts today during worship. I think that's all I have before we start today, so we will begin with a couple of songs. So we begin. <coughs> Thank you. 
ask you to please rise for worship. We make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let us now make confession of our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. O God, our Father, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have transgressed your law and have brought injury to others. We have not always shown forth our faith in every aspect of our lives. We sincerely repent of our sins, have mercy on us, and hear this our confession, O Lord. Grant us your grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ by the renewing work of the Holy Spirit within us. Lead us to amend our sinful lives that each day we grow in righteousness and godly living to the glory of your holy name. The Lord hears our pleas and accepts our prayers. To each of us, our Lord promises forgiveness, life, and salvation. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our service by speaking responsibly the words of today's intro from Isaiah 61, whole verse by whole verse. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. The Old Testament reading is Isaiah, chapter 25, 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that, we might, we might save, that he might save us. This is the Lord we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading, Philippians 4, verses 
4 through 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lonely, lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, and now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I learn the secrets of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before I get into uh, the reading for the gospel today, just a couple of quick words um, on what you heard in the Old Testament lesson, um, and also in the intro, it, if you were paying attention, today's intro it with the antiphonal verse from Psalm 146 was actually the basis of most of it was from Isaiah 61, which was the Old Testament reading, um, or at least a portion of it. Um, you caught this in, uh, in the intro it, where it said, uh, he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And then in the Old Testament reading from Isaiah 25, you actually heard um, that in a portion of that there, Isaiah describes, uh, on the mountain of the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Tzivaoth, he will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. And it's really, um, in both of those things, there's a wedding imagery that's going on that Jesus is going to draw from in today's gospel reading. And I'll spend some time on that during today's sermon. But I wanted to flesh it out a little bit with you first. And um, since my wife and uh, my son Tate are not in town this weekend, they went up to Kansas City for my niece's birthday, I get to talk about her a little bit since she's not here. You'll figure that out that I'll do that once in a while. So on my wedding day, and I'm going to talk about that too in just a moment, on my wedding day, you guys know how weddings go, the photographer is taking pictures of us and we got dressed and ready without seeing one another. And then they're going to take some pictures before the service, so they give me and my wife the opportunity to see each other before the service, right? So there she stood. She'd already been in the sanctuary. They were taking pictures of her in the sanctuary by herself. And then they brought me in to see her for the first time. And they gave us a little time, you know, just the two of us in private in the sanctuary to see each other for the first time before the ceremony. So I walked down the aisle and I met her about halfway down the aisle. And there she was standing alongside. And um, this will give you a little insight to your pastor. I walked up and I said, uh, you look different. Oh my gosh, open mouth, insert foot, right? Like, what not to say to your wife on their wedding day when she's all dressed up and gussied up for her wedding day. And now what I meant was, let me explain, what I meant was, she's not a, a big heavy makeup wearer, she didn't do her hair, but her hair was all done up nice, and she had more makeup on than I was used to seeing her in, and she was wearing a beautiful dress that I hadn't seen before that, and she indeed looked different to me, right? She was she was clothed differently, even made up differently, her face made up differently. I gave them some homework at the first service, I'm going to give it to you too. Go read Ephesians 5, all right? It's wives, starting at verse 22 to the end, verse 22 to 33. Wives, submit your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, right? And it talks about a bride being adorned for her husband, or robed, gussied up, in my words, fixed up like she was on that wedding day. And maybe the reason I said it in retrospect was because then I could draw from it when I became a pastor, draw from that, you know, 
experience that was a wonderful experience, but I didn't make it seem like a wonderful experience for her. And we sort of joke about it now that I said, well, you look different. Well, indeed, that's what is supposed to happen in a marriage, is that a marriage mimics Christ and his bride, the church. The church looks different to Christ, the bridegroom. We don't look like you know, sinful, spotted up, dirty, separate from the holy kinds of people because of our sins, but we're perfect. We're robed with Christ's righteousness, and we're without spot or blemish or any such thing, St. Paul writes in Ephesians 5. So that's why they wear the makeup. It covers up spots or blemishes. They fix up their hair. They're adorned in that white, beautiful dress because it reminds us, the wedding picture reminds us of what we are in Christ, robed with his righteousness. And then that leads us to the Old Testament lesson that you got today which is a feast. On this mountain, the Lord will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well-refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that's cast over all peoples, a veil spread over all nations. A veil of tears is what's been covered over. The veil of tears that we live in, the sin and the darkness of this world, the veil is lifted, and Christ gets to see his bride, the church. This is why we celebrate a long marriage. This is why we celebrate the gift of marriage that God gives to us, because marriage, Paul tells us in Ephesians 5, this is verse 33, I tell you a mystery, he says, verse 32, excuse me, I tell you a mystery, he says. That marriage is about Christ and his bride, the church. That's why we have the gift of marriage. And as we get into talking about marriage in today's gospel and in the sermon today, I want you to remember that we look different to Christ. We had confession and absolution to start off church today, right? You confessed who you are. I'm sinful and unclean. Sin in thought, word and deed. Everything that we do is permeated in sin. And when we come to church... The reason that we start off the service like that is we come in acknowledgement of who we are, right? We unload that at the beginning of services so the veil can be lifted. And Christ can see his bride. And what does he say to her? You look different. Not like McReynolds said it to his wife, right? It's a little bit more um, loving than that. You look different. You look wonderful. That's what I meant when I said it to my wife, right? Please stand for the reading of today's gospel. Hear now the holy gospel according to St. Matthew, 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we sing prior to our sermon.
grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's sermon comes from the gospel lesson you heard read just a moment ago. And since I was talking about my wedding day, I'm going to keep on talking about my wedding day a little bit. When we were married 26 years ago, there was, as you can imagine, a lot of planning that went into a wedding. There was obviously the engagement pictures that preceded the wedding day pictures that I referred to just a little bit ago before. There was the difficulty of securing the date at a church, but it wasn't just difficult to get the date at the church picked out, it was also difficult to make that happen on the same day that you could find a proper reception hall. You had to have a venue for the reception. You had to pick the food, so you had to sample foods, my wife's favorite part. You had to have the photographer there, send out the invitations, and pick the DJ or have a band. There was definitely a lot of stuff to do in preparation for a wedding. And you know, in retrospect, when we got married in 1984, or excuse me, 1994, I still can't get the date right, for Pete's sakes. Quick side note, you guys will appreciate this. Not long, this is not off, I'm going off script here, hang with me. So not long after our wedding day, I come home one day, I was really proud. I'd had a savings account for a couple of years prior to getting married. I came home, I was so proud I'd add my wife to the savings account, and that was in the early days of ATMs. And I got her an ATM card, and I showed up and I said, honey, got us a new bank account, or I got you added to the bank account, excuse me, got you a card to go with it so that you can use it at the ATM, and I made our PIN code, our anniversary date, the wrong day. No one will ever guess my PIN code because I gave her the wrong day because I can't keep the wedding day straight. That one's on video on the internet now, too. You can guess all you want. You're never going to figure it out if you steal my card. I got it wrong, too. We got married in 1994, back on track here. By that time, things had become pretty complex when it came to preparing for a wedding. I knew that prior to that time, there had been a simpler time a time where there were no outlandish, over-the-top proposals like in our day today. It didn't happen in my day either. I knew that before my day, there were no huge venues to schedule. Generally what happened was brides would get married to their husbands, they would go to the fellowship hall connected to the church for a cake reception, and then everyone would go home after that, and the bride and the groom would go to, well, we're not going to go there either. Right? You didn't have to have TV shows like Say Yes to the Dress. You didn't have to have meal planning and the right caterers and foods to serve. You didn't have to have the big crazy receptions or the live band or the DJs. You just had a bride and a groom, a pastor and a church and a wedding. You know, many of my brother pastors hate to do weddings. And they make no bones about it when we get together and talk about all the experiences that we have collectively, with all of the fanfare and the extras and the over-the-top stuff that goes with weddings nowadays. It leaves little room for the true meaning of marriage, as I referenced before, that you'll find in Ephesians 5, that the meaning of a marriage is that a husband and a wife are meant to mimic the bigger reality of Christ and his bride, the church. Oh no, all that gets left out. Pastors end up being servile to TLC watching bridezillas, hell bent on being the center of the show on their wedding day. The worship service in which the wedding is performed, let me repeat that. The worship service in which the wedding is performed, because that's the center of the day. The worship service where God serves his church ends up being second, merely a warm-up to all the real activities the world puts forward as being the most important, like the entrance of the bride and all of the wedding party that's there, the party bus that's waiting for them after the services, the pub crawl between there and when you get to the party venue, the perfect reception venue, the ridiculous introductions and entrances of wedding party into the party, the music, the special dances, you know, the first dance, the dollar dance, the chicken dance. Does anybody do that here? Or been to one where they do that? The food, the drink, 
Ultimately, God's word preached during the service, the worship service, ends as an afterthought in light of the after the wedding party. Done right, a pastor can indeed do weddings that celebrate the day with the bride and groom the same way they can also deliver the word of the Lord in the midst of the service. If during premarital counseling he counsels and coaches the couple properly, understand that the purpose of the service, the purpose of the day is to worship and to receive the gifts of God and to let God be the center of the service. I'm bringing this all to the pulpit today, not because I have an axe to grind or because my wife was gone and I just want to talk about her because she's gone. That's all fun and games. I bring it to you today because Jesus teaches us today in a parable. And he uses a wedding, an event that all of us are well familiar with, to teach. In today's gospel, Jesus' audience are the religious leaders of Israel of his day. We hearers today, present at Redeemer Lutheran Church, of this very same account, Jesus telling this parable, are a little bit different. We hear it because it's our appointed reading in the church lectionary. We're not the original audience to whom Jesus delivered these words. And I draw this attention very deliberately because it's important for us to acknowledge the fact that the parable that you heard me read just a moment ago that Matthew recorded for us was spoken to an audience different than you gathered here today. Verse 22, And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, Jesus' audience then was them. And them is a different audience than you here and now. This is important to understand from the very get-go, because if Jesus is speaking, teaching a parable, we need to understand who he's speaking it to, which helps us to understand why he spoke it. The words spoken in today's gospel reading by Jesus were directed in a way that was meant for a different audience than the ones that I am speaking to at this moment. Then Jesus spoke to Jewish religious leaders who were rejecting him. Now, I am telling you, presumably people of faith, Christians who do believe in Jesus and aren't rejecting him, that these words are being spoken to you, and that you will receive and do receive Jesus as Christ. That means the words have different intended audience and a different end goal. Does that mean this parable isn't for us and we can turn the page and pass on by? Not exactly. We'll come back to that. For now, let it suffice for us all to understand that Jesus, in our gospel today, is speaking to those religious leaders of the first century. We know that Jesus used parables when he taught his hearers. As such, we know that the details and the events of parables are meant to stand in for reality, to stand in for what he's seeking to teach. Hence, in order to understand the parable, we have to first understand what the details in the parable are standing in for. Jesus begins in our text in verse 22. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Let us not miss the significance of Jesus' teaching. He's teaching that his kingdom, he has come to usher in, and that the kingdom has begun. The wedding has occurred, and now the wedding party has ensued. The kingdom that he's come to usher in and establish back in the first century is like or can be compared to a wedding party. He compares his work that he's come to do to an invitation to the party. Now the truth is, all of us, I will presume, have experienced a wedding party, a wedding feast. We live in a time, as I already complained about, where the wedding party has become the focus on a wedding day. My complaint. But because of the emphasis on this as such an important part of a wedding, we all know, also, from having attended them, how much fun they are to go to. The pastor's not just a fun hater who stands in the pulpit and complains about this stuff because he's a stuffed shirt in his collar up there. 
I'd be a liar if I told you that I don't appreciate the value of a great wedding party and a great chicken dance. I love it. I love to go to these things, and not just chicken dance. So when Jesus uses a wedding party as an image in parable, it should be easy for any of us to relate. You want to be at the party. You want to be invited because you know there's going to be good stuff going on at it. Which is what makes it so crazy to think in the story that Jesus tells that when a king sends out his servants to call people to the party, to invite them in for the feast that he'd thrown for his son, that people didn't go. Hello? There's a party going on. Food being served. Celebration. You are invited. How many times when it comes to modern weddings do people skip the wedding ceremony in the church? That was my complaint. And they go straight to the party. In fact, did you guys know this custom? I didn't until just recently. That different kinds of invitations go out. Some just go to the people they want to come to the church service. Some go strictly to people they want just to go to the party. Two separate invitations. You're not invited to the church service. What? Are you crazy? That's the big part, as a pastor would teach them. Well, the wedding is for the family. The party's for the rest of my friends, but not in Jesus' telling of the story. No. Those who were invited, even they didn't, or maybe more accurately, they wouldn't respond to the invitation. So the king sends again tempting them with the news that the party has started. You've missed the beginning of it, but it's not too late. Verse 4, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. The king ain't too proud to beg. I'm still giving you song titles after last week's sermon. Are you still with me? Ain't too proud to beg. But alas, verse 5, they paid no attention and they went off. One to his farm, another to his business. While the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. Unbelievable. It might actually change how people sent out invitations in our day and age if when they sent them out, people didn't RSVP, they sent out and got killed, not RSVPing. That could change things. That's what Jesus is telling us in this parable. Seems unreal and absurd. But that's the example. I remember I told you earlier that we have to remember the audience Jesus was speaking to. He was speaking to religious leaders, Jews in his day. The reference in the parable up to this point is that God, who is the king in the parable, was inviting those who had been given invites to the party, Jews, to the party. Because Jesus had come from the Jews, he was inviting those who were already invited to the party, his treasured possession, to be at the party. But they were having none of it. In fact, they were rejecting it. Even being foretold in the parable that they would reject and kill the servants of the king. Who was Jesus talking about? The prophets who had come to foretell Jesus' coming to tell them that they were invited to the party that picked up when Jesus was born of a woman of a virgin named Mary. The wedding had begun, the party was in progress, but what's left when they fail to come and recognize Jesus? The king was to destroy them and invite to the party those who were not initially invited. In defining the terms of the parable, Jesus was telling his Jewish opposers that they were disinvited and that Gentile believers instead were going to be offered the coveted invitations to the king's wedding feast being thrown for his son. Now, any reasonable Jew in the first century would have been familiar enough with the wedding imagery of the feast, let alone those religious leaders who should have known it even better than the common folk. They would have recognized the meaning of table fellowship, that it was a feast, that it involved food. For you see, table fellowship was akin to saying that there was full and immediate acceptance of those with whom you dine. 
Thus, in the parable, the king, who is God, was reminding the already invited guests, the Jews, that they were already in full and immediate acceptance of the party, of the king who's throwing the party. They would not come, and they would not join in. So as a consequence, they would be left out, only to have those who were not initially invited receive full and immediate acceptance by the king to join him for table fellowship. And it was not just full acceptance, it was a celebration. It was a party. To whom was Jesus referring when in the parable he said, the king's servants went out on the road and invited anyone they could find, good and bad, into the party. This, brothers and sisters in Christ, is where you enter into the parable, where you become a part of the story of Jesus because you are the anyones who have been invited to the party as Jesus tells the story. You are the ones who can now be in the presence of a king with full and immediate acceptance. Why? Because the bridegroom has come. Jesus has redeemed his bride, and he's made her look like something different through the work that he's accomplished on the cross. So as much as this story seems to be a warning to and about the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you, brothers and sisters of Christ, it is also a message of joy for each of you. You've been called into the banquet and included as a part of the party on account of the gracious mercy of the king who's invited you in to have table fellowship with him. But it doesn't end there with you. The story isn't just about how you were invited to the party even though you weren't initially on the guest list. No. Because the very moment that you start to think that this gracious invitation of the king and the grace shown to you in the invitation can be taken for granted, the parable immediately turns into a double-edged sword, a warning to you that you could become just like those religious leaders of Jesus' day, a warning that participation in the banquet and entry into the wedding feast is not automatic. You see, just as the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day refused the invitation, you too can end up being just as guilty as them by refusing to attend. Remember, entry to the party requires the proper attire, per the parable. Within the context of the parable, we find those who are worthy to attend and those who are not worthy to attend. To be not worthy to attend is to be at the party without being properly robed or clothed. In the case of those who didn't come to the party, as well as the case of the one who came to the party without a wedding garment, it says in verse 11, neither party considered that the wedding feast was worth attending or at least preparing properly for. Some rejected the invitation outright while others came to the party not properly clothed. Herein lies the warning for us all. Because remember, you see, the wedding feast is at hand. Let me give you a very real example of this. As we all know, as I announced before services today, COVID has caused us to change up our regular weekly worship habits. For a time, we pastors became videographers and TV personalities. We had to do televised, videotaped services. We had to provide live streams of pastors leading empty churches for a time. At least that's what I had to do. And then I had to become a video editor on the side for a nice side hustle. And even now, we've been allowed to return to worship and public gathering allowed. Well, attendance is, we could say, lacking. Pastors everywhere wring their hands about, what are we going to do to get people to come back, to reduce their fears of coming into the services? How are we going to get them back to services? And folks, the answer is simple, as I see it. People, people need to understand that the wedding feast is at hand and that it's worth attending. As church, we have the burden of providing the safest possible environment for you to worship in, 
And here at Redeemer Lutheran Church, we are doing just that. We're sanitizing, we're following the directives of our state board of health, our governor, the CDC. We're consulting with independent studies and those who are trained in the field so that we can give to you, the members of our church, the safest place to be able to attend. And it is worth attending when you are present in worship, gathered as the body of Christ to hear the word of the Lord and to participate in the sacrament of the altar, table fellowship, which is full acceptance of our Lord, gathered as the body of Christ here in this place. Well then, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are at the party. And this is a party worth attending. Which brings us to another point in the parable. If those who are properly dressed for the party get to attend, well then what's the dress code? Where do I find the proper attire? Is it faith? Is it baptism into Christ? Is that my garment? Is it God's Holy Spirit living within me? Is that the proper garment? What is the right garment that some people have and other people lack in the story that Jesus tells? In verse 14, Jesus provides the answer, and he says, Many are called, but few are chosen. By all of these means, faith, baptism into Christ, participation in word and sacrament, God's Holy Spirit given through that, attendance in worship, you name it, all of those things wrapped up into one make the garment and include you with the proper attire. So hear the calling to the party. For you are being called. And I ain't too proud to beg. I'm going to stand here in the pulpit and tell you we want you gathered here in this place so that you can receive what the Lord gives to you, which is the proper attire. And this is the party. Several years back, I officiated at the wedding of one of my members back in Nebraska. And after the ceremony had ended... I was one of the last to leave the church. I know that comes as a shock, right? Pastor's last to leave. You know why? Because blah, 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 blah. He's talking to everybody there. And as the last one to leave the church and head over to the venue, the leader clans in Grand Island, I mentioned that at the first service, and somebody walking out said, we know the leader clans in Grand Island. It's a German social hall where all the German Lutherans gathered. It's now used as a wedding venue for people. My wife and I walked into the leader crans. I was in my collar just like I am now. She's on my arm. She looked different that night, did I tell you that? We walked into the party, and the party is thumping as we walked in. People have their drinks. They've all got their seats. And then pastor walks into the door, and you can almost hear the record scratch. And everything stops, and the room goes silent. Crickets. And everybody looks and says, oh, no. There's the pastor. Don't. Let him sit next to us, for this party is dead. But we were there for the party. And I told you, I can appreciate a good party. That's when the chicken dance started. And I joined in. And there across the room, I saw my church organist. She's not a very tall lady, but she's waving. Come. Come sit with us at the table where there's full fellowship. I'm reading into it. And we were welcomed to a seat at the table there at the reception. And we cut the rug out on the dance floor that night. And I might have, I just might have shared in a few Lutheran lemonades, if you know what I mean. Folks, I don't know what all the king has in store for those who are invited. I can't tell you all the details of the party. Isaiah does a pretty good job of it. A feast filled with rich food, full of marrow. That means a good old meal, and pastors never miss one of those. Well-aged wine, and I can tell you, I like a nice glass with my meal. The Lord has a party ready for us. The table is set. And I know something. You are invited on account of the sun. So welcome. Welcome to the party indeed.
And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds, keep you in faith in Christ Jesus, and invite you to the party. Amen. Please stand as we join together and confess our common faith in the triune God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With full confidence that our prayers will be heard by our loving God, we offer our petitions for the church, for the world, and for all people in need. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With hope-filled hearts, we pray for the community of world nations, especially remembering the people of Canada as they observe their country's National Day of Thanksgiving. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the well-being of creation in our land and every land. We pray for the coastlands and the waters and for all fields and forests. Grant that we would be proper stewards of all these good gifts that we have received. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, that it would grow as the Spirit leads and directs, even in those places where persecution of Christian people is still a daily reality. O Lord, mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are in need of special petitions this day, including the injured or ill, people who are hospitalized or under care in care centers. We pray for those who are dealing with special challenges, the shut-in, the unemployed, and for all those who are grieving this day. Especially, O oh Lord, hear the prayers of those and on behalf of those whom we list for you and before you in our hearts and minds. Be the support of all who are in need and the comfort of all those for whom we lift before you. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we remember with gratitude those whose earthly lives are now completed, we ask that we would be blessed by the memory of those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, especially those of our community of faith who have left behind examples of joyful trust and blessed hope. O Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn.
We have much to be thankful for, and so uh, as we wrap up our services today, I pray that you would remember in your prayer this week those who, um, who are mourning and having difficulty. Um, while in the face of these difficulties, we still have a reason to give our Lord thanks, that he has a promise, that he has welcomed us as his bride, and he will indeed raise us from the dead to join with him in a party that will never end. Um, I don't have any additional uh, announcements. I made most of them before services, so I, since I spit them all out beforehand, uh, I will wish that you have a blessed day. And we can the Lord watch as we um, begin to open up some new things, starting with uh, the, uh, the Vespers Society tomorrow evening at 6.30. But uh, as we work towards some of uh, that end, we'll see some uh, Bible studies start to open up here in Tacoma Sundays as well, so pay attention to, uh, to the schedule for that. So blessed day, and we can the Lord. Thank you.